The mission of the Atlantis is, however, grim for she has been probing the ocean bottom with deep sea cameras in an effort to pinpoint the location of the sunken submarine Thresher. It was the year 1963, and the star of the U.S. Navy submarine fleet, USS Thresher, had just sunk. 129 crew members were reported dead, and it would be one of the most embarrassing military failures of the decade. But the events that took place would remain a mystery until the year 2020. While the world knew about what happened, there was very little information on what really went down. The government had drawn a gray curtain on the incident, and the little that was released was mutilated with redacted. The Life of the USS Thresher The USS Thresher was a first-of-its-kind, world-class, nuclear-powered attack submarine with a crew of 96 enlisted members and 16 officers. The sub was designed to combat the threat of its Soviet counterparts like the November and Victor-class submarines. USS Thresher's innovative sonar technology was the most comprehensive and advanced system created for submarines at the time. She had this big sonar, which had incredible range. She could fire anti-submarine missiles, which were a new thing then. This advancement also came with the ability to resist shock and would effectively cause it to operate with reduced noise radiation, exactly what was needed for attack subs. For its size, the Thresher was fairly big at 278 feet 6 inches long and 31 feet 8 inches wide. It was also expected to dive roughly 1,300 feet, and its nuclear-powered engine also gave it unlimited range with a top speed of 20 knots, far beyond the existing stubs at the time. Its speed and incredible sonar capabilities earned it the title of the fastest and quietest submarine. In Vice Admiral Harold T. Duderman's words, Thresher is not just another ship. Thresher is totally different. Now she, as we saw it anyway, and I was a little bit in at her beginning, she was really a leap forward. She was the killer shark, the first real killer. The nuclear power source ensured it didn't have to resurface as much due to power problems. It also meant it did not require a hull shape for sailing on the surface. The Navy had depended upon this performance to the extent that it had asked for and received authority to build 14 of these ships, as well as an additional 11 submarines with very much the same characteristics. This was the first time since World War II that we had considered our design sufficiently advanced to embark upon the construction of a large class of general-purpose attack submarines, commander of Submarine Force Atlantic. The Thresher also had a well-designed interior that, although cramped, provided a moderately comfortable living space. The USS Thresher was definitely a technological marvel of its generation. Why, then, did it sink? Tests and Sinking of the USS Thresher On 8 April 1963, the Thresher, under the command of Lieutenant Commander John Wesley Harvey, departed from Kittery, Maine. It arrived at an area about 220 nautical miles east of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. That afternoon, after routine inspection, the Thresher had an initial trim dive test before descending for another 1,300 feet, which was her regular test depth, as she had descended a total of 40 times before. After remaining submerged overnight, the Thresher re-established communication with the surface vessel Skylark on April 10th. Following a pre-planned diving profile, the Thresher descended in stages, communicating with the Skylark at regular intervals to confirm the integrity of its systems. As it neared its planned test depth of 1,300 feet, the Thresher encountered difficulties and its communications with Skylark became scrambled. Followed shortly after an even more garbled message, 900 being the only distinguishable reply was received by Skylark. After this, nothing else came through to the surface. It was at this point that the communications crew determined that something had definitely gone wrong. By 3 p.m., 15 Navy ships were en route to search the area. And by 6.30 p.m., the commander of the submarine force began notifying the crew's family members, starting with Commander Harvey's wife, that Thresher was missing. Between the 12th of April to the 15th of April, the president ordered all flags to be flown at half-staff in honor of the 129 crew members. The chances of finding the crew alive was minute, even in the best scenarios. 129 men gone, all that machinery gone, all this cutting edge, you know, the beginning of this new wave of technology gone, and we don't have any idea what went wrong. Search and Recovery On the 12th of April, 1963, 
The Navy mounted an extensive search using surface ships with support from the Naval Research Laboratory with its deep search capability. To this end, a small acoustic research vessel called the Rockville was deployed. Rockville was to be followed by other personnel with a deep camera system. The Bathyscape Trieste was brought all the way from San Diego to Boston. It was then deployed for two series of dives into the debris field, the first occurring from the 24th to the 30th of June and the second from August to September. However, this operation had to be paused and eventually called off due to the inadequacy of NRL personnel to handle the towed vehicle. In a bid to recover the missing vehicle, the Navy included Mizar, a small auxiliary oceanographic research vessel in the search. Equipped with highly sensitive proton magnetometers, the magnetometers were suspended on an electrical line that also towed underwater cameras. The search commenced on June 25, 1964, and the entire wreckage was found on the 27th, two days after. The destroyed remains were 8,400 feet below the surface, more than seven times the test depth. The debris was found in an area spanning 1,440,000 square feet, and by July 22nd, the major sections of the sub had been found. Having discovered the wreckage, proper analysis was then conducted to find the cause. I couldn't think of any reason why uh, why she was lost or why she went down. The cause of destruction. After detailed investigations were carried out on the recovered debris, the analysis team were able to conclude and narrow the investigation down to a rather simple one. While still a theory, it was more believable than the many other theories that circulated. Apparently, a piping system which relied heavily on silver brazing instead of welding had suffered from failure. This caused flooding of the submarine. Things start to pop, water starts to come out. I mean, it's, you're right on the edge, and if you make the slightest mistake when at the edge, it'll kill you. Initially, though, tests had been carried out on the brass joints, with 14% of the tested joints not posing a risk significant to demand immediate repair. However, brass joint failures would happen repeatedly over the span of several months on ballistic missile submarines. Concerns about Thresher's piping system arose early in its testing phase. Simulations indicated that a single pipe failure could flood the engine room with substantial water, potentially hindering its ability to surface safely using its own power in blown ballast tanks. However, safety procedures addressed this potential issue. Specifically, the submarine had design features and emergency protocols intended to mitigate flooding and facilitate surfing even in the event of a pipe failure. The resurfacing process was usually start with the submarine attaining an inclined angle that would allow it to power to the surface. A possible explanation for the sentence, minor difficulties have positive up angle attempting to blow. However, for the blow process to have failed, something else must have happened, right? Well, yes. The investigation surmised that the high-pressure water spraying from the damaged pipe must have short-circuited one of the many electrical panels. This then caused the reactor to undergo a safety procedure called SCRAM, which is an emergency shutdown procedure designed to rapidly halt the nuclear chain reaction inside the reactor. SCRAM was put in place to ensure that in the case of a nuclear reactor failure, there would be no explosion or pollution. Another factor was that the scram restart time was a long and complicated process as it was expected that the crew would require time to troubleshoot and resolve the problem that caused the scram. An analysis revealed that at the depth of shutdown, the thresher would have needed about 20 minutes to restart and if they managed to isolate the short circuit in the reactor would have needed 10 minutes, which was more than enough time for USS Thresher to reach critical depth and implode. So they got a reactor scram, which lost all power. So even, even with the backup propulsion, with electric propulsion, I wasn't able to take and get control of the boat, the weight of it. And so it just went down. Records of the court inquiry were unavailable to the public until 1998, when the Navy began declassifying them. But in 2012, they decided they wouldn't release all the information to the public. However, in February 2020, a retired military historian filed a lawsuit to the federal court and ordered the Navy to begin releasing documents by May 2020. Bruce Rule's Electrical Failure Analysis On 8 April 2013, Bruce Rule, a U.S. Office of Naval Intelligence lead acoustic analyst for over 42 years, published his own analysis. His analysis was based on the SOSIS data highly classified in 1963. 
and the crux of his analysis was there was no flooding, and that the cause of the sink was a failure of an electrical bus that powered the main coolant pumps. He theorized that after two minutes of electrical stability, the bus failed, which also initiated the reactor scram, causing a loss of propulsion. This consequently caused the failure of the ballast blow. His theory better explained the 900 message as a reference to the depth below her test depth of 2,200 feet. The crew of Skylark also did not report hearing any noise that sounded like flooding since they were able to communicate with the thresher. He thus concluded that the implosion was instantaneous and took 0.1 seconds, a time too short for the human nervous system to process what was going on. All 129 crew members were dead in an instant. The USS Thresher was lost and six months later, the Navy announced that work on all 31 nuclear-powered submarines being produced in its likeness at the time was to be suspended. Subsafe Submarine Safety Program brought buoyancy extended safety features to Thresher-class submarines and until Subsafe improvements were finished, every operational nuclear submarine can only go to a maximum depth of 50% of its test depth. The loss of Thresher also spurred efforts to develop reactor scram restart procedures, which would speed up starting even further. That's not all that was developed as the Navy also established the Deep Submergence Technologies Project, or DSSP, to design and manage advanced deep ocean search vehicles that can reach depths of 20,000 feet and six rescue submersibles that can reach depths of underwater collapses. The USS Thresher was the first and deadliest loss of a nuclear-powered submarine in the whole world at the time. The pride of the Navy remains on eternal patrol to this day. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content. Until next time, this is Fleet Files signing off. See you in the next video.